Attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi everyone, this is Sarah Butler from Faith Trust Institute. I want to welcome you to today's webinar, Healing from Abuse, Resources for Survivors. I'll introduce our presenters in a moment, but first there's a couple of technical details to go over. First, you should be able to hear me as well as see the technical information slide on your screen. If you're having problems with the sound, please check to make sure that your speakers or headset are plugged in and that your volume is turned up. If you're having technical problems, I recommend that you exit the webinar, return to the link in your email, and then try to connect again. All audience members are muted throughout the presentation. If you have questions or comments, you can submit them to me using the question feature on the right side of your screen. We'd love to hear from you. Um, you can submit your questions anytime during the presentation. I'll hold on to them until the end, and we'll have about 15 minutes to answer as many questions as possible. If you don't see the question box on your screen, click on the little orange arrow at the top of your uh, right-hand side and on the screen, and you should be able to open up that feature. The slides you see on your screen will be sent to you as a PDF file later this afternoon, so you'll have them for your reference. And lastly, we're recording this webinar to make it available to those who can't attend the live session, so we welcome those who may be listening to the recording. We want to thank the United Methodist Women for sponsoring five webinars this year as part of their domestic violence awareness campaign. Their mission is to provide opportunities to grow spiritually, equip women and girls to be leaders, provide transformative educational experiences, organize for growth and flexibility, work for justice through service and advocacy. Please visit unitedmethodistwomen.org to read more about the great work that they're doing, and we thank them so much for their sponsorship. Our presenters today are Reverend Patricia Simpson and Reverend John Mark Galang. Reverend Simpson is currently the Seattle District Superintendent for the United Methodist Church. In July, she will become the senior pastor at University Temple UMC in Seattle. Pat's worked in many church settings throughout her career, and we're delighted that she's also a member of Faith Trust Institute Board of Directors. Reverend John Mark Galang is a senior pastor at Beacon United Methodist Church in Seattle. Originally from the Philippines, where he attended Wesley Divinity School and served in UMC churches, Reverend Galang relocated to Seattle in 2008 to serve at Beacon UMC. He's also the chair of the Board of Congregational Development for the Northwest Annual Conference of UMC. So I want to remind audience members, if you have questions, you can submit them at any time using the question box. And Pat, I'm going to turn it over to you now. Thank you, Sarah. Hello, everyone. And thank you for joining us for this hour of learning and conversation. I'm Pat Simpson. Mark Galang and I are both United Methodist clergy, but we do bring a good assortment of experiences. And to start out with, we're curious to know where you're coming from. So Sarah's going to put up a poll slide. And using that polling function, uh, we'd like to know um, your roles and experiences based on that list. Mark is currently pastor of a multi-generational, mostly Filipino church in Seattle. And Mark, before you came to Seattle, what kinds of churches did you serve in the Philippines? Thank you, Pat. Uh, back in the Philippines, I started ministry as a youth and children pastor in a city church called uh, uh, Covenant United Methodist Church. And after that, I served as lead pastor in one suburban church and two uh, other rural churches. I also helped in uh, church-sponsored prison ministry during that time. And, and, and since I moved here to Seattle in 2008, I've been serving as pastor of Beacon UMC, which is a predominantly Filipino, Filipino-American um, church. Okay, thanks. Um, I also bring quite a variety of experiences. I've served small town churches, uh, a suburban church, and two in the city. One of those city churches was an ecumenical church for homeless women. The other variety we bring is that Mark is young and I'm starting to enjoy my senior discounts. We'll speak from our own experiences, and then we hope your questions and reflections in the last 15 minutes will help relate what we say to your own context. You can see the results from the poll now. 
Looks like uh, a majority of our participants today are victim advocates or social workers. Uh, and you see the percentages of clergy, survivors, other, which could mean a lot of things. So from our various points of view, we will speak and listen today. Our presentation is structured around a groundbreaking interfaith declaration addressing violence against women. And Sarah, we can go with slide number six now. Uh, this declaration was launched in 2006. So please follow along as we read the whole statement aloud. Mark, you want to read this first slide? We proclaim with one voice as national, spiritual, and religious leaders that violence against women exists in all communities, including our own, and is morally, spiritually, and universally intolerable. We acknowledge that our sacred texts, traditions, and values have too often been misused to perpetuate and condone abuse. We commit ourselves to working toward the day when all women will be safe and abuse will be no more. We draw upon our healing texts and practices to help make our families and societies whole. Our religious and spiritual traditions compel us to work for justice and the eradication of violence against women. We call upon all people of all religious and spiritual traditions to join us. This entire declaration is available for your use on the Faith Trust Institute website. You can see that it's something you might use in crafting liturgy or prayers or even to use uh, in counseling. You can join there as a signer also. Now let's start making the connections with real life in congregations and communities. Violence against women exists in all communities, including our own and is morally, spiritually, and universally intolerable. This opening statement may seem obvious, but remember, you are a self-selected group of people who already care enough to sign up for a webinar on the subject. There are lots of people who really don't know how common domestic violence, child abuse, and sexual assault are or who think these crimes happen only among poor people or in bad neighborhoods. If we want to shape our faith communities into places of safety and healing, naming the reality of violence is a first step we cannot ignore. Domestic violence refers to a pattern of violent and coercive behavior exercised by one adult in an intimate relationship over another. Surveys show that it occurs in about 28% of marriages in the U.S. and Canada, and this number may be lower than actuality. The abuse includes physical, sexual, and psychological assaults and attacks on property and pets. 85% of victims are women from all classes, ethnic groups, religions, and cultures. Our second step after naming the reality is to use an unfashionable term, clear moral judgment. There are plenty of people who don't believe these behaviors are wrong. Many people of faith have a hard time grasping this because we tend to hang out with people who share our values. But you don't need to look far for evidence a worldwide porn industry that is shaping minds and desires, the tolerance of rape on college campuses and in the military, women hating music lyrics and comedy themes, or check out the hateful comments online whenever a story about sexual or domestic violence appears. Who will speak with a moral voice to counteract these people? 
Saying it's wrong is our responsibility within our own faith communities and in public. So let's start close to home in our faith communities. And to set the stage, uh, Sarah's going to put up another poll slide uh, asking, have you ever heard a sermon or other teaching addressing domestic violence in your congregation if you're part of a congregation? And as you uh, check those boxes in response, I'm going to go on to address that question, who's in your pews? You may notice that I'm switching uh, terminology now to say domestic violence, though ties with other forms of abuse will continue to appear. What we do to become healing communities regarding domestic violence will provide benefits for all kinds of survivors. It is fairly easy to introduce domestic violence in a congregation as a social issue or as a justice issue. At least in United Methodist circles, people are used to hearing teaching and sermons that call for advocacy and urge compassion toward people who are suffering. But the farther away these people are, the easier it is to hear. I can tell you firsthand that people start squirming when the preacher talks about them and about their relationships. Uh, in one church I served in Edmonds, Washington, as associate pastor, I preached a sermon about domestic violence. Uh, and uh, it was well received until I began to name the reality that there must be people in the room who had uh, been touched by domestic violence, either as survivors or perhaps as perpetrators. And when I said those words, you could feel a chill descend upon the room. Uh, and after that Sunday, people started calling the senior pastor to complain about how dare she say that about us. Now, I could see from the poll results that uh, in your experience, hearing domestic violence specifically addressed in that public setting in church is not a common experience. Only 15% said yes for sure. So it sounds like your faith communities uh, are going to face this question as well. So in your imagination, picture your place of worship and the people who were gathered there. Odds are most of them are married or partnered or have been in the past. And then remember that 28% from a few minutes ago. Nowadays, some of those couples might be two men or two women finally welcome to sit together at services. They too may be experiencing domestic violence. You may have youth in dating relationships just forming their values and children being shaped by their parents' behavior with each other. Add to that relatives, friends, co-workers, and it's likely that half the people in your pews have been impacted by domestic violence, but have never heard a faith leader speak directly to their experience. What a missed opportunity for compassion and healing and justice. When we name the reality of domestic violence, and say clearly that it is wrong. We have taken a first and second step. Then we need to take that scary third step that brings the chill into the room. We need to bring it home. Almost certainly there are survivors in your congregation and among people close to them. There may be people currently suffering abuse, perhaps in grave danger. And there are probably perpetrators there. This is not just an issue out there about those people. It's also about us. And until we own up to that, we're not ready to help anybody else. We acknowledge that our sacred texts, let's go to the next slide. 
We acknowledge that our sacred texts, traditions, and values have too often been misused to perpetrate and condone abuse. It's not an accident that that situation exists silently in our midst. Speaking as a Christian, we have centuries of complicity behind us during which we supported forms of patriarchy that allowed abuse to flourish. Marriage rituals handed over ownership of women from their fathers to their husbands in the custom of giving away the bride. And our legal systems made that a brutal fact. Domestic violence and marital rape were legal until just a few decades ago. Women in many states had no property or economic rights in marriage. This is not ancient history. Elders in our churches today remember those times well. Just ask them. With this weight of the past just beginning to lift, it's no wonder we have the residue of old behaviors and attitudes among us. Sad to say, there are large segments of Christianity still preaching forms of submission that put women and girls at risk. Supported by selective use of biblical texts, the concept of male headship in the family is still alive, along with the companion concept of biblical womanhood. Though we won't explore this today, I encourage you to search out these terms online. Interestingly, you will find that writers who defend this construct of divinely ordered authority of men over women often acknowledge that it can serve as a rationale for emotional abuse and violence, and they go on to argue seriously for a compassionate form of male domination. Though I don't believe that the construct can actually be remade in a way that serves women's safety and flourishing. We can't ignore these ideas. Even progressive churches have members who have been formed by such teaching in the past, and the public perception of Christianity has definitely been tinged by it. Our members, and particularly our youth, should be equipped to counter these ideas with a robust defense of the equality of women and men in God's creation and in intimate relationships. Bad excuses for violence are woven through the fabric of Christianity and they're hard to tear out. Biblical themes of submission to God, theories of atonement that hinge on Christ's self-sacrifice, the glorification of his suffering and that of the saints. These aspects of tra tradition have been used by Christian clergy to keep women in dangerous relationships with little accountability imposed on the men responsible for violence. The sacred and sacramental value placed on lifelong marriage, and in some traditions, the prohibition of divorce, makes it extra hard for a Christian abused spouse to flee. Even the confidentiality of confessions and pastoral conversations has often served as a shield for abusers. These things all linger in church life, ready to ensnare us in surprising and confusing ways. But let me propose one thing that is simple. The whole abuse condoning fabric is held together by a tradition that is not sacred at all, silence. And that we can do something about. So we draw on our healing texts and practices to help make our families and societies whole. And we have two stories for you here. One is the second part of my story about preaching on domestic violence. Uh, while those angry people were calling the senior pastor to complain, survivors were calling me 
to come forward to talk about their experiences and to say thank you uh, that their church recognized that what they were going through. Uh, there were a number of these people, but they didn't know each other. So I confidentially invited each one of them to a gathering where they met each other, talked about their experiences, and then together they became the core group that offered a service of healing and testimony uh, where uh, some of them spoke, uh, others came uh, to listen and to share their own experiences and stand in solidarity. Uh, and we offered prayers for healing for individuals uh, and prayers of thanksgiving for survival and recovery and prayers for uh, those still unknown who were in danger. Uh, those women were able to go forward together and support each other. Mark, I know you have a really amazing story from your congregation. This is a good time to share it, I think. Yes, thank you, Pat. Um, in, in October, um, sometime in the fall, uh, a team from our church went to attend a two-day training uh, called Safe and Healthy Churches Training. The trainers were dynamic, and I found that event really a hope-filled event. Uh, one of our takeaways as a group was the important role that people of faith and communities of faith play in preventing and ending family violence. Our participation made us aware of the issue, and I would say it also probably has empowered us as a church to try, I mean, at least try to do something about it. So after the training, we talked about what we can do as a church, a church who's serving predominantly an immigrant population where the issue of domestic violence and abuse is not talked about, where people in our community are probably even in denial that this is even happening in our own homes, where there is this culture of silence that such events, even if they're happening, are none of the church's business because it is a domestic issue a private issue, a family issue. And we have that value system that whatever happens in the family stays in the family. So to talk about it is to put members of the family in a bad light and it could break up families and this has prevented many people from talking about it. But that team that attended uh, that training thought that it is about time for us to speak up. They were telling me that it's about time for the church to stand up and to stand beside families who are affected by this issue. We hope then that as we talk more about it, we will be able to bring more healing to our people and to our community as a whole. So we decided to address the issue head on during one of our worship services in, in, in October. We designed the worship service around raising the awareness of our people about this issue in, in making our people realize that it is happening that even if we deny it, it doesn't make it less real. I was asked to preach about it and, and, and my sermon was well received but I believe that the, the boldest move that we have made then was when we decided to ask those who know anybody who had been a victim to stand up for them and, and, and with them and pray for them. We then also invited the others who were still sitting down at that point, who was willing to stand up for the perpetrators to do so and pray for them as well. You know, we were, we were surprised on how many people, on how many people stood up. Even more surprising was when one of our worship team leaders stood up and started talking about his own experience. That was not part of the plan, but he came, he, he came out unprompted and he started reminding us uh, that the effects of, of domestic violence is not only on women, 
but also on men, particularly the children, particularly the children. And then he sh started sharing with us his experience as a child in, in, in a family where this is happening. It was really an emotionally charged but uh, spirit-filled time for us. It was one of those services that we'll never forget. It's a very powerful service that we had on that Sunday. Now, a few days after that, um, there were a couple of incidents that had happened in the Filipino community, both here <clears throat> in, in, in Seattle and, and back in the Philippines. One of the incidents was regarding uh, a transgender woman in the Philippines who was allegedly abused and killed by a U.S. serviceman stationed in the Philippines then. And then the second incident is closer to, to home because it, it's, it was regarding a murder-suicide involving a Filipino family in South Seattle where, uh, where a man killed himself and his daughter and his granddaughter after it was learned by family members that he was sexually abusing the latter. When, after this happened, I got a call and an invite to join members of the community who are coming together for a vigil because of this, of this incident. When I got to the gathering, I realized that I am the only one who is a person of faith in, in the room. And then I was asked by the organizers to speak about this issue from the perspective of my own faith tradition. I did so, and but after the vigil, I asked the organizers, why was I invited in, into this gathering? And I was told by them that they heard what we are doing at Beacon around this issue, particularly uh, about the service that we just had. That it so happened that one of them, one of the organizers, has attended worship at Beacon on that particular Sunday that we had our domestic violence awareness service at church. You know, this opened the door for us at Beacon to work more closely with this group around several other issues in our community, even up to the present. So today we are continually trying to figure out what are our next steps as a faith community? Since that service in October, we had taken several steps already. The issue of family violence have been part of our greater conversation in making the church a safer place for people to be in. We organized a, a ministry team that would help us figure this out and, and lead us into this, into this work. We are also now in conversation with uh, with the Christian education or the spiritual formation ministry team in our church in looking for ways <clears throat> and looking for materials about this topic that are, that are faith based and that are age appropriate. We want to be on the preventive side as well of this issue and we realize that educating our children and our youth early on and helping our families to talk, to op talk more openly about, uh, about it are ways that we believe that would help. So, so this is where we are right now. This is this is our story at this moment, and we're, we're trying to get there. But I know that we're not there yet. But these are the steps that we are taking um, now. This is our story, Pat. Thank you so much, Mark. Yeah, uh, clearly the story is still unfolding, and the the life of your church has begun to be permeated with these concerns. Uh, there's so many themes here. The wisdom of beginning with a team of people uh, before launching into the challenge to the congregation. Uh, the, the awareness that uh, what we do in the church can spill out into the larger community and that people are paying attention even when we may not know it. And how much it meant to those organizers at the vigil that your church had already stepped up and uh, become part of the conversation. So, listeners, how can your congregation become a place of safety, refuge, and healing for victims and survivors of domestic violence? 
On this slide and uh, several to follow, uh, you'll see material from Marie Fortune's 2014 webinar called Circles of Healing. It's archived on the Faith Trust website, and I encourage you to look at it if you want to dig deeper. A congregation could start with any one of these approaches and build from there. You can see that they range from very public things like a sermon or a prayer in a Sunday service, to smaller groups like a class or a Bible study, to very private settings like counseling. All of these things can have a part in creating an environment of awareness over time. And as Mark's story from Beacon highlighted, it's that long-term commitment that allows you to build on each thing uh, to create that new culture. Scripture is a really important resource for us. I noted earlier that selective use of scripture is often a tool for supporting domination and violence, but we can change that by using the Bible with integrity to God's purpose of justice and mercy. Resources from scripture are some of our most powerful tools for awareness and healing. Take a few moments to imagine a woman hiding fresh bruises under her Sunday clothes, hearing this Psalm 55 read in church. Just a few verses. My heart is in anguish within me. The terrors of death have fallen upon me. Fear and trembling come upon me and horror overwhelms me. And I say, Oh, that I had wings like a dove, I would fly away and be at rest. In verse 12, it is not enemies who taunt me, I could bear that. It is not adversaries who deal insolently with me, I could hide from them. But it is you, my equal, my companion, my familiar friend, with whom I kept pleasant company. Uh, this really touches the experience of someone living in that atmosphere of danger and betrayal of love. Um, this kind of use of scripture is uh, faithful to God's purposes uh, and very specifically uh, connected with the experience of a victim or survivor. We have a slide from the prophet Isaiah. Um, imagine a survivor who is exhausted with the challenges of rebuilding her life, hearing the steadfast love of God proclaimed by the prophet in this passage, and drawing strength to get through the week ahead. Mark, I think we have time for you to read uh, this whole slide. Sure, let me read this. <clears throat> Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint and strengthens the powerless. Even youths will faint and will and be weary, and the young will be will fall exhausted. But those, but those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Yeah, and isn't this the kind of hope and strength that we want to share with? those among us who are struggling and suffering and tired, uh, and to let them know that they do not walk that road alone. And then one more scripture uh, from the book of Romans, and I'm kind of stepping out on a limb here, but imagine a perpetrator who has been confronted with the sinfulness of his behavior drawing from this powerful declaration 
the courage he needs to repent, to make reparations, and seek to amend his life. I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. If someone really believes that, it is possible for conversion and renewal to happen. Back to the Declaration uh, and widening our scope now beyond the congregation. We commit ourselves to working toward the day when all women will be safe and abuse will be no more. As we create an environment of awareness and declare that our churches stand for safety and right relationships, people in need will surface both from within the congregation and from the community. And this begins the stage of action. We move from breaking the silence and learning about domestic violence to survivors sharing the testimony of their own stories, and then we face a different level of challenge. Accompanying survivors with practical and spiritual support requires a significant commitment over time through different stages of a survivor's process. The resources of scripture, tradition, hope, and prayer are powerful and vital. We should never underestimate them or fail to offer them. Yet a healing faith community also needs practical knowledge and resources beyond its own walls. Clergy and congregations need to develop competence to respond effectively or great harm can be done through well-intentioned ignorance. This is especially true when we counter a person suffering active abuse. The good news is, though, we are not alone in this work. In communities all over the U.S. and Canada, people and resources are available to help us become faithful and effective advocates for people impacted by domestic violence. They may not be right next door. It may take some effort to find them, but building partnerships in our communities is an essential step forward. The mapping tool shown here and in the next three slides is available through the Faith Trust website. It was developed for use by faith communities and by secular service providers to encourage relationships that will provide safety and support more effectively. You see four steps here. Affirm, assess, make safety the number one priority, and then refer the survivor to expert help and community resources. Here's the second piece of the brochure. See how you're not alone? The victim is surrounded by her faith community or comes to church asking for help and spiritual support. But in turn, the pastor and congregation have others surrounding them crisis support services, support to move beyond the crisis once safety is established, resources for long-term needs, and advocates who are working toward a safer community for all of us. Your challenge is to make these circles of support real by finding and meeting the people who do this work in your own community. This is homework that a task force in your church can do, researching names and contact information and making personal connections where possible. Don't hesitate to make these calls. You will usually find that service providers welcome your interest, though they may be surprised. They want to pave the way for good referrals. And this can actually work both ways. They may be glad to know a minister in a congregation to which they can refer a survivor struggling with a crisis of faith or needing spiritual support. Not just any church will do. 
Although many people working in these fields are believers themselves who see their work as a vocation, pastoral care or prayer may not be something they can provide. They need a church to help their clients, just as the church needs their expertise. And some of them may need the church in another way. People providing direct service to abuse survivors encounter trauma and suffering day after day. It's a heavy load to carry, and they have their own needs for spiritual sustenance. For some, a congregation that gets it may be more than a reliable ally and resource. It may become a church home. As you get to know the professional resources in your community, don't forget to take inventory of your own assets. You have people, those who can provide compassionate support and perhaps some with professional skills. You may have a confidential meeting space, a pastor's discretionary fund, a food pantry, someone who can drive a family to safe shelter, Connections through your denomination may be helpful to a family that has to leave town and could use church support in a different community. I once helped a family that was assuming a new identity by providing replacement baptismal certificates with their new names. Our parsonage was once a safe house for families. You have more resources than you think. Survivors who have found their way to solid ground may become the church's most effective ministers in this area. Provided with resources to navigate the roadblocks of Christian tradition and offer the resources of the faith, they can give ongoing support to each other and to those who may come with urgent needs. Their faith, forged in struggle, can provide life-saving hope to those in spiritual crisis who will not have to walk that road alone. Our religious and spiritual traditions compel us to work for justice and the eradication of violence against women. We call upon people of all religious and spiritual traditions to join us. As you create awareness in your congregation, build your capacity to help individuals in need, and forge relationships with your local allies, you are also part of something bigger. The struggle against domestic violence and other forms of abuse is a multifaceted, worldwide movement of deeply committed people. Many are survivors themselves. Many have taken up the work as a vocation because their faith tradition calls them to work for justice, stand with the marginalized, and act with compassion. Others share the values of equity, nonviolence, and mutual help from a secular stance. We hope the work you do locally will inspire you to wider advocacy and action in partnership with these allies. You will learn from them, and out of the riches of our own tradition, our healing rites, our scriptures, our wellsprings of hope and faith, our fervent prayers, our zeal for justice, we will bring our unique gifts to the movement. May it be so for you in your community and beyond. Thank you for being part of this. We will be responding to questions shortly as this becomes a two-way conversation. Take some time to note the resources on this slide, especially the community resource inventory map. There is so much to learn, and we want you to have the information you need. Faithtrustinstitute.org is an easy access point for these items. United Methodist Women, offers two resources, and your annual conference or diocese, synod, presbytery, etc., may have a regional resource library where you can check out Faith Trust Institute curriculum materials and DVDs. I'll hand this back to Sarah, who's going to emcee our questions. 
Wow, thank you both so much. That was really wonderful. Um, so one of the things that you spoke about, Patricia, was um, actually the heavy load that um, service providers and victim advocates carry. And I think that many people in our audience can certainly relate to that. Um, and how those people are often in our congregations and can be a, a resource. Um, so I don't know if you want to speak to that at all, either of you, but Patricia, I'll send this to you first. Okay, um, I'd actually want to introduce a term here that's become familiar to me from uh, social workers and uh, therapists that I know. Uh, the concept of secondary trauma. And if you want to look up uh, some resources online, I think you could use that as a search term. It's the idea that that accompanying people in trauma and in their recovery process uh, does uh, have that secondary impact on the helping professionals or volunteers and exactly, uh, family members and friends as well. Uh, and that it's important, particularly for, for professionals who do this full time, to have their own support system in place. And that could be supervision, it could be peer groups, could be a therapist. Uh, but for many people, it will be their own faith community. But it has to be a faith community uh, that understands what they're going through. So uh, that's what I was trying to get at. I think you said that really well. Mark, do you have anything to offer on that? OK. So Mark, oh, I'm... I, think, uh, I think that was well said. Beth. So Mark, I know that um, the group that you brought to the training in October, um, I, I believe there were four of you, um, I'm wondering how uh, that group has been able to kind of reach out to other people in your congregation to kind of, uh, because oftentimes um, these issues become one person's mission or two people's mission and the way to really affect change is to get everyone to share in the mission. So I'm wondering um, how you've gone about creating that kind of network within your congregation. Sure. Uh, so what happened, what came out of, of that training, uh, of these four people who, who were part of that training is that when they came back, uh, one of the changes that they, uh, they, they were, they, they, they help us uh, navigate as a church is to institutionalize this this work by creating a um, um, a committee or a ministry team that really um, would work on this on this area, and they started inviting people to join them in these conversations. And they look at it at the at the, the wider conversation about safety and and wellness um, uh, in the church, and so there are other people who started signing up because of that. Great, thank you, that makes sense. We actually have a question uh, from someone in the audience about is it possible or suitable to institute a, a abuse slash crisis intervention team, although there may not be any ongoing awareness that something is happening in the church? Um, and if it's, so if there are no reports, is it worth it to have some people on hand who are prepared to deal with these issues? And Patricia, I'm gonna send this to you. Well, that's an interesting question. I mean, based on the assumption that there are people uh, in the congregation who are connected that may need intervention, um, I think it might make sense to uh, work maybe with your providers in the community to educate and prepare a team first, uh, but nobody's going to use them unless they know they exist. So I think it would make sense then to uh, kind of debut the team uh, and then to provide some context, biblical and theological, about why this is a service the church will begin to offer, uh, whether someone comes from outside or within the congregation. Again, you just you can't, uh, can't keep it silent forever, but having that preparation time may make sense in some congregations. Okay, I have another question uh, about setting up healing circles for those affected directly or indirectly um, by clergy sexual abuse. Um, and uh, let's see, do you have, um, 
potential liability issues. So I think this is kind of a question about uh, establishing policies um, to create safety within the congregation. Um, so Patricia, I'm going to hand this to you. I imagine you have a lot of policy experience under your belt and maybe uh, Mark can answer after. You know, most of my policy experience is more at the, you know, bigger than congregation level. I think it's uncommon for a congregation to have a clear policy around these things. Uh, that's a problem, by the way. But uh, the uh, convening any kind of a healing circle, uh, whether it's around domestic violence or other kinds of abuse, including clergy sexual abuse, it's complicated because helping people find each other without violating their privacy, uh, pushing them beyond where they want to go is a, a delicate dance. So when I described, for instance, that outreach in my church, uh, people had come to me confidential with confidentiality and uh, I couldn't say, oh, so-and-so came also, but I could one by one invite them to gather uh, in a safe place, uh, in a non-public, uh, non-announced uh, situation. Uh, and then the ones who wanted to meet other survivors could make that choice. Uh, and I think that's the safest way to proceed. Uh, but you're going to need a convener uh, who has access to resources uh, and who has some training uh, to make sure that there's backup because it, this will surface things for people even sometimes from long ago uh, where they're going to need to seek more support. I'd say I think it's worth doing, but uh, it's, it's worth doing with care. Uh, and uh, uh, not, it's not only liability issues, but the issue of, of uh, doing further harm that I think is in front of us. Yeah, you make a very good point, Patricia. Um, That's all I've got. Okay, well, that was great. Um, so um, let's see, audience members, if you have any other questions, you can certainly submit them. Um, otherwise, I'm going to ask um, Mark and Patricia to say any final words or final thoughts. Um, so, uh, Mark, we're going to start with you if you have any final thoughts for our audience members about um, where to go, what to do. Sure. Um, I think it's a it's a wonderful um, work to be in, but it needs a lot of it needs a lot of prayer for for people because it, some of them are very fragile at this point uh, in in their situations, and therefore there's a lot of care. There's a lot of care that should be taken into consideration while we do this work. Uh, but an eye opener for me is that we can't just be silent about it. I mean, when we started talking about it, that's when we started to know that there are people in our congregation um, who, who are in need of this of this care. And so probably it's about time to step up and start talking about it. Thank you, Mark. Uh, Patricia, I'm gonna let you have a, the last word here. Well, let me just first say amen to what Mark said. I think that foundation of prayer is really important. Um, I would say that a certain amount of humility and patience is really necessary to this work. It's necessary in the congregation because you know change comes slowly. Some people get it first and others will have to be brought along gradually. But uh, in the direct work with individuals, particularly those who are in situations of danger, that humility and patience uh, needs to be right there for us. We can't make a decision to push somebody, to leave an abuser, uh, or to take action. Uh, people have to make those decisions for themselves. We can provide resources, prayer, support, accompaniment. But that journey, uh, that, that step, uh, is something that we have to back off from and let uh, a survivor make his or her own decision. And the humility piece also uh, comes into this not going it alone. You know, we, in the church, we often think we have to reinvent everything. 
In this case, it's not true. Uh, we will be able to make our own unique contribution uh, as partners with others who bring knowledge, who bring lots of experience, uh, particularly survivors themselves who have shaped other uh, traditions and responses and practices of this movement. Uh, we're joining the choir. We're not the choir director. And, uh, and together, I think our voices will be stronger. So get to know those people in your community. Uh, seek out resources and then build on them with the resources of your faith. Uh, and I'm just, I'm so heartened that we had 40 people coming to this. And uh, for those that are listening uh, in the archives, I hope this has been a good spur to take further action. Thank you. Well, I want to thank you both. Um, this has actually been really helpful uh, and very eye-opening. And um, I want to thank the United Methodist Women for sponsoring today's webinar. Um, and we're about to close up here, so I want to ask uh, participants that when you close up the webinar, you'll be asked to fill out a short survey. If you would just take in a moment or two to give us um, some feedback about this webinar or suggestions for future webinars, um, we would be very grateful. You can view all of our upcoming webinars at faithtrustinstitute.org. I have a couple of them listed here. Um, and uh, we would love for you to join us for those. Our next is on June 10th, and it's addressing elder abuse in your faith community. Um, and June is Elder Abuse Awareness uh, Month. So that's something that we all need to be thinking about. I want to thank you all for joining us today. Um, this concludes our presentation. And I will email the present presentation slides to you later this afternoon. Thank you so much. Have a good day. Bye-bye.